on all that information there. So let me, let me kind of begin. Let me remind ourselves that we have two radically distinct narratives. You know, we got the Jewish Zionist narrative that we've kind of portrayed the story from the beginning of the late 1800s to the beginning of the 1900s and early 1948 and what happened just thereafter. The Zionist story was simply a desire for a nation state of their own. Uh, they, they felt that they needed to have a place of their own where they can have their own laws for the sake of their own protection. And that need for their own state with the idea of, of nation states and nationalism becoming prominent late 1800s, that need intensify with the rise of anti-Semitism throughout Europe and obviously the Holocaust in the 1940s really just ex exacerbated that need. We got to get our own state. The Palestinian narrative, the Arab narrative was, well, first off, why should foreign nations be allowed to uh, partition our land uh, and uh, give immigrants a state of their own within our land? You know, especially when you realize the United States and Great Britain closed the doors to the Jewish immigration. So here's this European problem of anti-Semitism. The United States and Great Britain closed the doors for immigrants, for Jewish immigrants to come in and said, well, here's what we'll do. We'll give them Palestine. And the Palestinians and the Arabs were like, that doesn't make any sense. So the second thing with the Arab narrative is that they simply believed that the partition of their land was unjust. And I'm referring specifically to where we kind of ended our last episode with. In 1947, the Palestinians owned about 80% of the land. Um, uh, uh, th thank you very much, Rod. Uh, uh, the Palestinians owned about 80% of the arable land and 94% of the total land. That was the Palestinian land. The Jews owned about 6% of the land, and they comprised a third of the population. Yet the Jews were granted 58% of the land in the 1947 UN partition plan, and they were given 84% of the arable land and, and key access to water supplies. And so that didn't make any sense to the Palestinians. And then uh, there's another problem that we ended up with at our, our last episode, and that was that the United Nations partition plan, which divided into two different states, well, two different lands, the Israel became a formal state, the Palestinians wasn't actually an official state. But in the Jewish land, the land that was designated for the Jewish people, there were almost 50% of the people living in that land were Arabs. And this becomes a significant problem for uh, the, the people of Israel and the new state of Israel, and we'll just, as we discussed a little bit before, uh, and we'll discuss more as we proceed tonight. Now, what happens then is May 14th, 1948 becomes Israel's day of independence, and it's a day of celebration. We've got our own state. We, we, we've succeeded three years after the Holocaust has ended. Hooray. What a great story of victory. But May 15th, the next day, becomes known as the Nakba, which, and you may have heard that word, it means the catastrophe. The idea being that many of the Palestinians lost their lands and their homes. 700 to 750,000 Arabs were removed from the land. 531 Arab villages were destroyed and 11 urban neighborhoods were emptied. And the Palestinians refer to this as the ethnic cleansing. There's, there's an Israeli historian, Ilan Pape, who actually wrote a book called The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. Uh, Israel claims that they left as a result of a war. So you have this, these two kind of narratives going on here, again, with what really becomes the first significant issue. And that first significant issue uh, is the issue of the refugees. So again, you got about 750,000 refugees that were displaced 75% of the Palestinian Christian and Muslim population in mandatory Palestine were either fled or expelled from their homes. They became refugees in the West Bank, so the refugee camps in Bethlehem, for example, and the Gaza Strip, and of course, refugee camp, refugees in surrounding Arab countries. 400,000 fled to Jordan or were forced to move to Jordan, if you read Elias Shakur's book. Uh, 150,000 crossed the borders to Lebanon, and there's still refugees in Lebanon to this day. And 200,000 uh, uh, refugees went to Gaza. Others went to Syria. Now, these countries uh, struggled to absorb the massive influx of refugees. And I'll address that either later on in this episode tonight or perhaps in the next episode, because that's a common accusation. And that common accu accusation is why weren't the refugees simply assimilated into other countries, as we'll discuss tonight? The Jews were refugees from um, various uh, Arab states, Iran, Iraq, and other places, and they traveled to Israel, and Israel welcomed them in. Why doesn't Lebanon receive them in? And if we have time tonight, we'll discuss that question, that very question. If not, uh, we'll make sure it gets on the docket for perhaps our next uh, uh, episode, which will be next Wednesday night, uh, if you're watching this somewhat live. 
All right, so now December uh, 11th, uh, 1948, the United Nations gives resolution 194, which declares that all the refugees must be allowed to return. So again, whether they left as an act of war or whether they left because they were for, they were told to leave or they left on their own free will uh, is, uh, or they were forced out by Israel becomes a disputed matter. But nonetheless, the United Nations says they need to return to their homes. Now, the picture you see on this particular slide is actually the entrance to the Ada refugee camp or Ida refugee camp in Bethlehem. And you see this massive key on the top of that, uh, uh, the, 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 thing of a job to enter into the into the camp. That key is a symbol that many of the refugees in that camp have keys to their homes that Israelis now live in. And this becomes a significant issue, the refugee crisis for the Palestinians. Now, of course, Israel's response was there's no way they're letting the refugees come home. And there's a number of factors behind that. Uh, ben Gurion, David Ben Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, stated uh, emphatically the return of the refugees must be avoided at all costs. And one of the reasons for that, as we discussed, uh, as I discussed in the last episode, was simply the fact that Israel, the many of the uh, the architects of Zionism believed that for this Jewish state to survive, this Zionist state to survive, it had to have at least 80% of the population be Jewish and 20% be Palestinian. And if you allow these Palestinians to come back, that's going to skew those numbers and make a Jewish democracy. And we'll discuss the idea of a Jewish democracy, which is kind of an oxymoron a little bit. Uh, and our next episode of the episode after that uh, also. So that was one of the factors that, that we cannot allow these um, refugees to return home for this particular reason. Now, in all of the peace deals, especially the ones from 1967 on, and you may have heard of all the different, you know, the Oslo Accords and, and uh, uh, Camp David, and, uh, one of the negotiating issues for the Palestinians is the right of return for the refugees. And Israel has had a strong policy since the beginning. That's a, not a, that's a, a non-topic. It's, it's, we're not ever going there. And the Palestinians say this is a requirement. And so you can see why there's this inherent conflict that, how are they going to resolve this conflict if they can't even agree on this very basic issue, which is one of the one of the central issues? Now, you may also have heard this has come up in the news quite a bit recently. Uh, it's called UNRWA, uh, the United Nations Relief Works Agency. It's actually the longer title is the United Nations Relief Works Agency for the Palestinian Refugees in the Near East. In other words, it's specifically a United Nations Relief Works Agency for the Palestinian refugees only. It was actually have their own branch of the United Nations and uh, endeavored specifically to address the Palestinian refugee crisis. Now, UNRWA actually employs about 30,000 people. Most of them are Palestinian refugees. So the idea of UNRWA is to provide employment and relief directly to the refugees, whether they're in Gaza, whether they're in the West Bank or wherever they may be. And its mandate has been broadened to include education, healthcare, and social services. So the funding to UNRWA is actually very significant for the well-being and survival, really, of the refugees, whether they're in Gaza or, again, in the West Bank. Now, Israel claims that they're not actually refugees. Again, they were people who left because of a war, and that's not what a refugee is. And you, you attacked us. You left because we, we, we responded back. And it's your fault. So they don't consider them refugees. And so this is one of those issues that Israel looks and says, if you guys acknowledge the refugees, then you're really undermining our conviction. So you have this Israeli narrative, the Palestinian narrative, and the Israeli narrative says, we cannot recognize the, the refugees and you shouldn't either. And so that's what happened when Donald Trump came in and said, we're actually not going to fund UNRWA any longer. He was giving a concession to Israel and to the Jewish di uh, uh, kind of the Jewish contingency, saying, "Okay, I'll." And the la but the United States was one of the primary funders of UNRWA, and you can see the uh, uh, the humanitarian crisis that actually uh, arises over this. That's also why, if you're aware of what's happening, like in the present day, one of the claim is that there was about thirteen. I think it was thirteen people that worked for UNRWA. The thirty thousand people that worked for UNRWA that were actually Hamas operatives. And because of that, the United States and others said, oh, well, if workers for UNRWA were operatives of Hamas on October 7th, 
then we're not going to fund UNRWA any longer. And you can understand the humanitarian crisis that's going on in Gaza as it is because food and all the every, everything else was not allowed into Gaza. And then you defund UNRWA. Well, now we have an even greater uh, humanitarian crisis. Now, uh, you'll also notice, by the way, that uh, very quickly, as a side note, uh, Trump also made the decision uh, to move the embassy from uh, Tel Aviv, the, the United States embassy, to, to Jerusalem. And again, that actually was a very significant thing because what was happening was since 1967, and we haven't gotten there yet, uh, Israel gains control of East Jerusalem and they claim that it was our capital. Trump says, okay, great. We'll recognize it as your capital. We'll move the embassy to Jerusalem. The problem with that is, is that Jerusalem's claimed as the capital for the Palestinians also. It's supposed to be a shared capital. Again, one of the issues when it comes to negotiating a peaceful resolution to this conflict, the refugees is there and Jerusalem is a shared capital. As soon as you move the embassy, uh, the American embassy to Jerusalem, you're saying we recognize it as the capital for the Jewish people, Israel, but we don't recognize it as the capital for the Palestinian people. That's why I was a member of a number of a delegation. We went to uh, the State Department in uh, 2018, I think May 1st. On May 14th, of course, the day of independence for Israel, Trump was going to move the embassy to Jerusalem. And we went and spoke to Trump's advisor in religious affairs. We had a group of evangelicals and we said, and uh, his advisor in religious affairs was an interesting woman. And she says, so uh, what can I do for you guys as we sat down in the State Department? And we said, well, you know, we are evangelical leaders and we don't support the idea of Trump moving the embassy to Jerusalem. The idea was Trump was doing that maybe to pacify the evangelical voter. So we're like, hey, we're evangelicals and we don't support this. And her response to us was, that's a done deal. Anything else you want to discuss? Again, we had like a 45-minute meeting with her, and that was off the table. So we said, well, hey, how about, you know, the next time Vice President Pence goes to visit Israel, he also goes to visit the Palestinians. You know, and so we had this conversation about how they can also represent the Palestinians and the Israelis and, and give kind of greetings to both sides. The idea being that when you move the embassy to Jerusalem, it's a slap in the face of the other party, and that is a hindrance to bringing peace into this issue. So again, the Zionists then go, going back then, the Zionists claim that the refugee crisis is simply not their fault. And they also claim, and I'm sure this might come up in my conversation with Daryl Bach on Monday next week, on the 25th of March, because uh, he's claimed, made this claim a number of times in conversations that I've had with him. And that is, why don't the other nations take in these refugees and solve this problem? It can go away. Uh, and the answer actually is not that simple. It's very, very complex. And again, if I can get to the issue tonight, I will. If not, I'll get to it uh, tomorrow. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, next Wednesday in episode number four. But there's another important factor that I think it's worth mentioning, and that is the idea of Jewish refugees. Another thing that's often noted by um, the Israeli narrative or the Zionist narrative is, hey, we aren't the only refugees because as soon as Israel became a nation in 1948, they started getting expelled from other Arab nations. And this is what they, the Israeli claim. Jews from many of these countries were expelled as a response of these countries to the expulsion of the Arabs from Palestine. Now, they also claim we absorbed the Jewish refugees into Israel, so why can't these other countries absorb the refugees into their countries? The, the, the non-Zionist response, or the Arab or the Palestinian response, is that many of these countries, the Jews weren't actually forcibly removed. Uh, for the most part, it appears historically that they weren't forcibly expelled. Some of them left for a variety of reasons. One was, well, they wanted to emigrate to the new Jewish country. And so why not do so? Of course, most of them, I think, as far as I understand, wanted to stay where they were. But some of them left because, well, they weren't expelled yet, but they felt or feared that anti-Semitism was going to come to Iran or Iraq and these other places. And so they left uh, as a precursor to being expelled with anti-Semitism. And then, of course, they came into uh, the, the state of, uh, of Israel. Actually, I'm looking at my notes here. I have a comment in my notes here about why don't the other nations take in the, these refugees uh, amongst them? One of the problems becomes this in terms of why doesn't Lebanon, why doesn't Syria, why doesn't Jordan take in these refugees? First off, some of them did, especially the jo Jordan did. Jordan took in some of the refugees. They became Jordanian uh, uh, citizens. But some of these countries, for one, the Arabs of Palestine are not the same as the Arabs of Lebanon. There's a cultural, ethnic, religious identity that's different amongst them, that they're not the same. Um, whereas 
uh, the Jews had commonality, at least with the immigrants from Europe and elsewhere in the state of, uh, of Israel. But the other thing actually is, that's significant to understand is that there's a delicate balance in many of these countries, Lebanon in particular, a delicate balance between the Christian and Muslim representation in the country. Le I think Lebanon has like a, a population of eight million, if I'm not mistaken. It's been a number of years since I've studied the studied this specifically. And I, I think it's like 70% Muslim, 30% Christian. And when they actually wrote their constitution and for the structure of their government, uh, it was along the lines of, well, in order to maintain peace between these communities, we're going to have a certain representation from the Christian community and a certain representation from the Muslim community. If you welcome in the million Palestinian refugees, that well, and now it's over a million refugees in, in Lebanon. If you welcome them in, most of them are Muslim. And it will start to throw off that balance that was necessary for keeping security and peace in Lebanon. So there's factors like that that are involved. Other factors were, hey, these, these um, refugees are coming in and they're starting to uh, uh, rent apartments and everything else. And what that did was it jacked the prices of rent up. And so now the average person in Lebanon can't afford to rent an apartment because there's less apartments available, you know, supply and demand. They started taking some jobs and now Lebanese don't have access to some of their own jobs. They're being put out of work. So there was a number of economic and geopolitical factors as to why some of these countries didn't uh, bring in the refugees. The other thing I think that's important to, to note, and that is the refugees didn't want to be absorbed into these countries. They wanted to go home. They wanted to go back to their own countries. And I think that's something that it gets too easily thrown around in terms of, oh, what do we do with the refugees? Like, they want to go home. So they should at least either go home or ultimately be compensated for uh, their loss. And obviously now, 75 years later from 48, uh, you have the fact that um, you have children and grandchildren, and it's not as much going home because they actually never lived there. And that is another another issue. All right, moving along. we got to speed up this a little bit here. Uh, I get long with it. So uh, the green line or the armistice line, in 1949 was then drawn. Now, what happened was the United Nations uh, um, uh, said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give this percentage of the land to the Palestinians and this percentage of the land to the Israelis. We already discussed 58% of the land goes to the Jewish state when they only had a third of the population. What's going on? They only own 6% of the land. You're taking Palestinian land and giving to the Jewish people. This doesn't make any sense. Okay. Well, the after the war, you can see the green line, and I'll show you the maps here in just a second, the next set of maps. Uh, the green line it literally was drawn with a green pen, a green mark, distinguishing the West Bank and then the Gaza Strip. And you'll notice here on the, the maps that I showed you the, the previous nights, the first map uh, uh, here shows you what, uh, what it was like prior to 1946, mostly Palestinians, the white representing the Jewish people own lands. And again, it's not completely accurate, that map, because there are state-owned lands that are not represented on that particular map. The second map uh, on the left there is the United Nations partition plan. 58% of the land goes to the Jewish people, 42% goes to the Palestinians, with Jerusalem and Bethlehem kind of being an inter international zone. That's the yellow in the middle map. But the third map shows you what happened in 1949 when the armistice line was drawn. And notice the West Bank and Gaza in map three are actually separate. Um, that I, uh, oh, thank you. Okay. Got, got looking at the, I, I need to stop looking at the comments because they're interrupting me and, and distracting me. I apologize guys. Uh, I'm going to turn the comments off just so I don't see them right now, but thank you for, for putting your comments in the comment box. But what's happening then is the, the green being the Palestinian lands. Notice Israel and Gaza are now separated. Whereas in map two, they're actually not separated. There, there's, there's a, 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 a cross point between the two. And you can see that the green is actually smaller on the third map than it was in the, on the second map, meaning Israel was given, instead of 58% of the land, what they actually received was 78% of the land, 22% of the land to the Palestinians. And so this becomes another problem in terms of, of the issue of land. As I said in the, on uh, episode number one, uh, this was a land issue. An issue of land lies fundamentally at the heart of, of this conflict. Now, again, we'll go to what we said on, on number one, and that was the miracle of the War of 1948. And I gave an anecdote either in number, episode one and episode number two. Uh, on that, many Israelis and even some Christians point to the miracle of 1948. Uh, the Jewish refugees who had just survived the Holocaust become a country three years later. They survive the onslaught and the attack of Arab armies, and they become their, on our homeland after 1,900 years of not living in the land. 
clearly this is the hand of God. And of course, not all Israelis believe that. Israel is basically a secular state. Got to remember that. Um, but some do. And of course, many of the evangelicals, many of the Christians and the dispensationalist and times ideas were kind of thrown on to this, especially with Hal Lindsey's book in 1970, The Late Great Planet Earth. This is the hand of God. Now, it's also important to note here that there are Orthodox Jews in, in America, and I, I'm not sure if they're elsewhere or not, who actually oppose the modern state of Israel because in their minds, uh, the belief is that only the Jews can only come back to the land when the Messiah brings them back to the land. They certainly are not going to come back to the land as a result of war. And since this victory was a war, it's simply not the hand of God. So uh, th that's something interesting now. Uh, now, uh, another point that comes up, of course, is that, well, if this is a miraculous victory because they were attacked by all these surrounding Arab nations and this small little nation of Israel just established itself three years after the Holocaust, and, the, and yet they won. And the reality is the Israeli army won based on all the data because it had more troops. Uh, within the next couple of years, they had about the same number of troops as the Arab armies that were attacking them, but slightly more troops at the beginning. They had better training. They were trained by the British, and they had more weapons. They even received some weapons from Russia. The communists decided to arm them. So they, they had simply more troops, better training, and more weapons. That's why they succeeded. It's not because this was the hand of God, per se. This is actually what happens in the result of war. Now, another important factor in that war and in the victory that's often not discussed is that the Israel-Jordanian Agreement in 1947. You see, if the Arab nations surrounding Israel attacked them and it included Jordan, then the Israel, the nation, the new state of Israel would have had a problem because the Jordan army was significant enough with the other Arab armies, Egypt and, and other armies, to actually maybe do some damage and maybe threaten the state of Israel. So Israel actually made an agreement in 1947 with King Abdullah, and it was a secret pact that said, here's what we're going to do. You will not join the Arab armies in attacking Israel, at least not in the lands that the United Nations gave to the Zionist state. So if there's a war taking place in those lands that the United Nations says are ours, you will not attack. And here's what we'll do. The West Bank, the, the, the stuff that the United Nations says belongs to the Palestinians, we'll let you have control of that. So the West Bank actually became under Jordanian control. And if you lived in Palestine at the time, you actually got a Jordanian pass, uh, pass uh, uh, um, uh, visa, what, you know what I mean, a passport. That's what I want. So uh, that secret pact actually was not known at the time, but that's another reason why, again, this was not a massive successful victory in war because of the hand of God, but maybe because they simply had uh, a, a bigger line. Now, this also, however, becomes a problem for the state of Israel, and that is because the West Bank falls completely under the control. Uh, actually, I'm going to go back to that map here for a second here. Um, uh, there. Uh, notice that in this third map, there's no yellow spot, uh, international spot around Jerusalem. Jerusalem didn't become an internet. It became part of Jordanian control. And what that meant was that Israel actually has no access to Jerusalem. In fact, for the first time since the Roman era, they have no access to to Jerusalem and obviously the Wailing Wall and Bethlehem and these sites that were for uh, Hebron, which were important sites for the Jewish people. They have no access to that, and that became a problem uh, uh, for the Jewish people. So this leads us now to the next uh, significant uh, factor, and really the modern crisis now. I hope I've given you enough of historical context of the two narratives that, that are going on that led to where we're at today. But where we're at today really has two major issues added to these narratives, and that is the issue of occupation and the issue of settlements. And these are extremely, extremely important. Now, before I go on there, let me kind of give you a commercial announcement again. Uh, Determined Truth, if you go to DeterminedTruth.com, you can get access to the blog. Click on the blog tab. I have a whole bunch of articles on Israel-Palestine and all that good stuff there. I have uh, issues on um, articles on all kinds of other topics. You can look them up there. Uh, if you go to the podcast tab, you see that we've been doing a series on the book of Revelation for more than a year. We've got uh, 200 or 300 other podcasts there, all accessible for, that you can download, available on Spotify, iTunes, and everywhere else, anywhere else uh, you get your podcast. 
We also have a YouTube channel, and I want to encourage you to sign up for the YouTube channel and subscribe if you haven't already done that. The more subscribers that we get, the more hits that we're going to get, the more YouTube's going to go, oh, this this is an important site. Let's make sure we promote their work. It just really helps prom promote what we're doing. So subscribing to that and subscribing even to the blog, that's a little bit more complicated how you subscribe to the blog. But if you subscribe to the blog, when you click on a blog and you, it takes you to Patheos and you subscribe on the blog, what it actually does is uh, it notifies you by email whenever I give a new post. And that's, that's all it is. It says sign up for the newsletter. It's not a newsletter. It's simply an email reminder. Hey, Rob gave a new blog, which I typically do every single Monday, uh, but not always. I think next week there will not be a blog. So we're a 501c3, a nonprofit. Uh, our conviction is that the church today in America is fractured and broken. And many young people especially are leaving the faith altogether and they don't know where to turn. You hear this word deconstruct so often. Now I'm deconstructing my faith. I think it's the wrong term. I think we need to reconstruct our faith around Jesus and the kingdom. I, I think the church has lost sight of the gospel of Jesus and the gospel of the kingdom and the idea of Jesus as Lord and Jesus as the king. And that's what a lot of my blogs, the podcasts, the YouTube, that's what we're really trying to promote is this is what the gospel and the kingdom looks like. And I think it's really appealing, especially to the people that have become disenfranchised with the church. So I, I want to encourage you to support our ministry as much as you can. Uh, also, of course, on the determinedtruth.com, you'll get the at links to all the upcoming uh, um, podcasts and uh, you, I'm sorry, the uh, different uh, live streams that are coming up. And again, next week on uh, Monday, I'll be uh, discussing uh, all of this with Dr. Daryl Bach, who's a Christian Zionist, and we'll, you'll see his ideas and my ideas and how we go back and forth. Okay, moving along. Here we go. As we're running along again today, um, again, six minutes without uh, um, uh, sound might do that to you, right? Uh, so here we go. 1967, the Six-Day War, June 5th to June 10th, 1967. Israel launches what they call was a preemptive attack. What obviously other nations say, no, uh, Israel simply attacked us without warrant. Uh, they claim that Egypt and the surrounding countries were amassing troops on the border in order to attack Israel. Uh, it is true that Egypt had moved some troops to the border, but they were actually defensive troops. Very few people today actually support the idea that this was a preemptive attack in terms of historians. But nonetheless, Israel used this uh, as a pretense for going in the war. And they said, we are under threat. And they launched an attack. And in six days, uh, it's a, an incredible feat. They defeated the Egyptian, the Jordanian, the Lebanese, and the Syrian forces. Uh, and so what you see now here on, on this particular map, as you can see, they gained control of the entire Sinai Peninsula from Egypt. They gained control of the West Bank from Jordan. They control, uh, gained control of the Gaza Strip, of course, as well. And also, of course, up here in the north, you might not see it too well on the smaller map, but they gained control of the Go Golan Heights from uh, Syria. Uh, and this is actually very significant. One of the reasons why the Golan Heights was especially important was because this is where the source of the Jordan River is. So the, the Jordan River actually exists above the Sea of Galilee and below the Sea of Galilee. It's still it's the same river. And the origin of that river is up in the Golan areas. And so they want to have control of that for that reasons, as well as, of course, control of the high ground. So now what's happened then is uh, Israel not only want to control the, of the water sources, they also want to control of the, of the higher territories here. So um, uh, let, let me continue on here. Uh, what happened, however, was they actually gained control. What, they became the occupying power of the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and of course, East Jerusalem. Uh, in other words, um, uh, occupation basically is a military control over a foreign civilian population, and it's intended to be temporary. Again, Israel's claim was we, we did this here uh, as a temporary uh, thing because we were under threat and we needed to have control uh, for this purpose, and, and especially of the high ground. If you know the geography of the land of Israel and the West Bank. The West Bank is mostly mountainous. It's the hill country of Judea and Samaria, right? Uh, the lower areas, the coastal plains, was what the nation of Israel actually was constituted of. And they said, we need, we're worried about Iran sending jets over and that we can't tell if they're coming because the hills are in the way. We need to control the high ground, the Golan Heights and the West Bank for that purposes, as well as put control of, of the water. So now what you have then is these dual narratives, as I mentioned before, I'll go over this kind of quickly here, that Israel said it was a war of self-defense. We were being, we were afraid of being attacked. Uh, and so we attacked them before they could do harm, which 
by law, international law, would actually be a legal justified reason for going to war. Uh, of course, I think many officials today recognize that that's not what was happening. The 80,000 troops in Egypt that they moved to the border was not a sufficient number to threaten Israel. They were mostly a defensive uh, force. Um, and uh, this is not uh, uh, probably a, a preemptive attack. The Arab response, of course, is that this wasn't a preemptive attack. It was a war of aggression, and Israel needs to return the land. And now this becomes uh, the, the whole problem. What's, what this means is that since this war of 1967, Israel has remained the occupying force. In other words, they didn't leave. They attacked these lands, they gained control of these lands, and they didn't leave. Now, they did leave. The Sinai, they gave it back to Egypt. That's fine. They gave the Sinai Peninsula back, back to Egypt. Um, but uh, they annexed the Golan Heights from Syria. They said, it's ours. They annexed East Jerusalem, and they remained the occupying force of Gaza and the West Bank. Now, the significance of this becomes the pre-1967 borders becomes another important factor in the issue of a peace resolution. How are we going to bring peace to this resolution? We have the refugee crisis. You know, we have Jerusalem. We have these different statuses. Well, the next one becomes, well, Israel needs to retreat back to the 1967 borders. And again, notice each one of these peace deals, the Palestinians are getting less and less and less of the land. You know, the Peel Commission gave them more land than the United Nations partition did in 1947 which was more land than what they actually got in 1949 after the armistice line, was the green line was drawn, and now uh, they're, they're looking for even less land. Now, each time, the, the Palestinian land actually becomes sm smaller and smaller. Now, Israel uh, thought that not only was this important for um, uh, defense purposes, but of course also for the reunification of Jerusalem. Uh, again, Jerusalem had not been in their control since 49, and the armistice line was drawn, or access to Jerusalem at least wasn't available to them. And so they wanted to reunify West and East Jerusalem. And again, they an they annexed, meaning East Jerusalem wasn't just accessible to them as an occupier. They made it part of Israel and they reunited it. Uh, and here's an important uh, thing to understand. See these two pictures here? What you see on the right-hand side uh, is the Wailing Wall, of course, black and white, before 1967. And what you're going to notice in front of the Wailing Wall, uh, this is the Wailing Wall, this is the Temple Mount up there, uh, is Arab houses, er an Arab village. What you see on the left-hand side is the Western Wall Plaza today. So not only did Israel annex East Jerusalem and gain control of all this area, they actually demolished an existing po uh, Arab houses to build this plaza to make it even more accessible for the Jewish people. So again, this is just another factor contributing to the issue of justice and the concerns of, of all these people. So the Palestinian narrative then uh, becomes simple. Uh, these, are al these are occupied territories. This is a war of aggression, and Israel needs to give the land back. And because of the occupation, uh, Israel has continued to have uh, uh, serious um, issues of justice in terms of what's happening in the land of Palestine. And I'll discuss this in my next episode as we're running a little bit low on time here. So let me kind of go a little bit uh, quickly through the last couple points here, and that's this. In 1967, you created another wave of Palestinian refugees, except it was not to the same level as what happened in 48. Many of the refugees left, uh, some of the ref lef refugees left some of the land because of the war, but many of them stayed. Now, it's important to, reckon, to remember that even if this was a war of self-defense on Israel's part, a preemptive strike, it's, a, it's land that they captured as a result of war that they're required by international law to give back. And so the Palestinians are like, hey, they need to give it back. Of course, the United Nations gave another resolution. Resolution 242 says uh, you need to give the land back. It belongs to the Palestinians and, and they have to have it. Uh, they did return the Sinai to Egypt. That's okay but they needed to go further than that. They did not return uh, the West Bank and Gaza uh, to the Palestinians. And so that becomes uh, one of the significant issues then. Now, also in this conversation, what you're going to see then uh, is, I'm trying to look at my slides here, and it's kind of hard to see. Um, uh, 1967 then began this era of occupation. Uh, and what that meant was the Palestinians now live 
under a foreign military. Their movement and almost every aspect of their lives are actually under strict military control. Again, Israel claims that this is important because they are worried that the Palestinians are going to blow them up, so they keep them under a tight, tight control. That control is easy to say oppressive. It is intensely pr- pr- opp- oppressive. We did a podcast. I didn't look this up before. And about two years ago, I'll look it up maybe for the next live stream, um, uh, with uh, Daniel, I think it was Daniel Manier. I always get the, the sons of, of uh, Salim Manier uh, uh, wrong. I apologize for that. But uh, talking about how there is actually a program for internationals to come over. It's called the International Accompaniment Program. And internationals come over to the West Bank and they accompany children to school. Now, like, why do they need internationals to accompany children to school? Because in order for children to go to the school, they have to go through one or more checkpoints, Israeli checkpoints. Whether This is in the West Bank now. To go from their house to a school you know, downtown, they have to go through a checkpoint. Well, guess what? They, children get harassed, severely harassed. And they're traumatized. And the teachers say these kids are worthless at school for the first several hours of the day, if not the entire day. But when an international accompanies them, then they are not harassed because the Israeli soldiers look and see a, a person from Germany or Norway or the United States, and they don't harass the children. So you can see how oppressive this occupation actually is, and we'll discuss that uh, in the next episode because I think that's a significant thing that, that's going on. Now, for the Israelis, of course, you know their claim is that, well, this is not a war of self-defense. Uh, the, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, this is a war of self-defense and that they need to maintain control over the occupied territories because the Palestinians are a threat and a, and a danger to them. And this becomes a significant and serious uh, issue in terms of, of what's going on today. Uh, and there's a lot more to discuss that I'll, I'll go over in episode number four. And we might have to do a sixth episode as I can see that I'm running low on time. All right, now, settlements, of course, become the last issue here. I'm going to finish up. I've got a, a class, a Bible study, a Zoom study that starts in one more minute here. Um, but settlements become another issue because what happened was Israel not only became the occupying power in 1967 over the West Bank, and it's an oppressive military occupation, they actually began moving their population into the land. And this becomes a very significant issue. Settlements are, and you can see an Arab uh, shepherd looking at a Israeli city in the background of this picture on Palestinian land. So settlements are Israeli towns or cities built in the occupied territories. Uh, in other words, Israel doesn't just continue to maintain a military presence in the West Bank. They began moving their own people into the West Bank. And I'm going to go over that in much more detail. But this becomes a serious obstacle for peace because, again, if the issue is Israel has to withdraw to the 1967 borders, the question becomes, how do you do that when there are today 700,000 Israelis who now live in the West Bank. If you withdraw to the 67 borders and make a two-state solution, what do you do with 700,000 people? You just, you can't uproot them. You can't move them out of their homes. But these settlements are actually a confiscation of Palestinian lands and Palestinian uh, villages uh, and, and farmlands and they build massive cities so much so now that there are 700,000 Israelis. And I think this is the massive obstacle to peace and the idea that Israel wants to live in peace with the Palestinians. Well, I think maybe they do, but if they did, they would stop building settlements. And I wrote a series of blogs, I'll finish up with this, back in, I think, June of 2022, uh, in which I said, um, the status quo is not the status quo. And what I meant in those, I think it's seven blogs, was right now in June, of, June July of 2022, it's, there's nothing happening. There, there's no massive uptick in violence. It seems relatively peaceful. We got the status quo. Hamas is staying over there. Israel's staying over there. We're okay. And it's just, no, actually it's not. Because every day that goes by, more Israeli citizens move into the West Bank, forcing Arabs out of the West Bank. You see, the reason why... Israel didn't annex the West Bank is because to annex the West Bank means you now include millions of Palestinians into the state of Israel, and they don't want that because it upsets the, the, the uh, Jewish democracy idea. You, they just simply couldn't absorb these uh, Palestinians into the land. But instead of doing that, what they seem to be doing is they have been pushing the Palestinians out 
and taking over the land without the people. And that becomes this, one of the serious issues. All right, so the next episode, I'm going to talk about these issues of justice and injustice a little bit on both sides, but especially what's happened since 1967 with the building of the settlements and the uh, the occupation and what all that means and why the Palestinians would resist. We'll talk a little bit about Palestinian resistance and the intifadas, which does not mean violence necessarily. Uh, and then the fifth episode, we'll, we'll look at where do we go from here? And to be honest with you, that's kind of a short episode because I don't know where we can go from here. I, I really don't. Um, and I, it's above my pay grade, but I know a lot of people who aren't really sure where we can go from here. There are some solutions, but the way things are going today, I don't know how those solutions would actually work. Again, I want to thank you very much for, for being a part of this. I'm going to look at the comments in, uh, in the threads. I'll cut and paste them then, uh, and maybe I can address them in the next episode, but I appreciate it uh, uh, very much.